Hello, and welcome to The Fool and the Philosopher. The Philosopher and the Fool. World War I. Okay, who was... So, you know, World War I was um, different from World War II because, looking back, most people agree there was no bad guys. Yeah. There was no evil nation. It was just everyone making the best of the mess that Bismarck made, basically. Yeah. But I think there was one country that was the worst. Okay. Canada. Right. Do you know about Canada's history in World War I? Not a whole lot. Okay. I do know, I can know a small amount, but not a whole lot. All right, I'm going to talk about a little bit of Canada. All right. This is from memory, so hopefully I don't forget too much. But, um, so, re you remember the Christmas truce? Yes. Where uh, people got out and played soccer or football and yeah. that sort of thing. So Canada was the only country that didn't observe the Christmas truce. No. So in the second world, in the first, in the anniversary of the first year of uh, First World War, yeah. Christmas again, um... They, the Germans poked out over their trench yeah. with uh, boxes of cigarettes and chocolates, I believe. Yeah. And they said, hey, it's Christmas time again, our friends. So the Canadians took that opportunity to shoot them because they weren't behind cover. Um, another thing the Canadians would do is they would throw corned beef into German trenches. And so the Germans would be like, oh, more, more. And so they'd all come out to like grab the corned beef and stuff because... There was a lot of com because you you were stuck with the same people a kilometer apart for um, years. So yeah. it, it, there's there was a sort of camaraderie between the two sides, yeah. and they got used to it. But so what the Canadians would do is they'd throw corned beef over, and so the Germans would run out and they'd grab it like they'd run out into their trench because yeah. they're throwing it into the trenches. Yeah. And they say, "Oh, more, more, more!" And so then when they're all gathered celebrating, waiting for their second wave of corned beef, yeah. the Canadians would throw grenades over and blow them up. Um, the other thing is, I don't know if you've heard about trench raiding, but it was this incredibly dangerous, incredibly bloody thing that yeah. um, everyone in the war did at the start, where you would sneak in the middle of the night into an enemy trench and attack with whatever you had, like yeah. daggers or, or push daggers, uh, brass knuckles, whatever, and just try to kill as many people as possible and then sneak away. Yeah. But it was considered far too dangerous, and a lot of people... There's also an aspect to it of just the brutality of it. Yeah. Um, so... After the, about the first year, most people discontinued um, doing the uh, trench warfare, yeah. except for the Canadians, who specialized it to such a point that they were going s like over a kilometer past enemy lines and killing people. So there was people just sitting around in trenches way back from the front, like, oh, we're just we're safe here. We're not on the front anymore. And the Canadians were sneaking into those trenches and killing them. The other thing about Canadians is they didn't take prisoners. They would shoot anyone that they... So when they did a trench raid successfully yeah. and they surrendered, they would just kill all their prisoners. Um, and they would also... If they did take prisoners, they would beat them. And um, there was a case... Their, their commands told them not to take prisoners as well, like their commanders and generals mm -hmm. and whatnot. There's a case where they were taking prisoners and this is on record of a Canadian... There was a prisoner who had a great coat on, like a German prisoner. Mm -hmm. So he slipped a live grenade into his pocket and then walked away from the prisoner. Um, so th when Germans took prisoners from the enemy side, they'd mm -hmm. treat the, they would treat the Americans well. well I don't know if the Americans were probably volunteers. Um, they would treat like the Belgians, the French, the British. They would, they would treat them all respectfully as, but they would actually single out the Canadians and beat them because they hated the Canadians so much because they were so afraid of the Canadians. Um, the Canadians were known for their, like, unbelievable savagery among the Allies as well. And, uh... Why was Canada like this? They don't know. <laughs> Is it like, oh, we have to go fight some colony war and go across the sea. We might as well get done with. They think that there's some theories on it, so... Well, I mean, they were the most removed forces, I think. Besides maybe Australian forces, who were treated... So, th there's some theories. Uh, one of the theories is that they wanted to show the Europeans that they could fight as well, because they it was a European war, essentially. Yeah. And so the Canadians were like, yeah, we're as good as, we're, we're as, good as anyone else sort of thing. We're going to show them who's boss. Another one is, there was rumors at the start of the war that a Canadian soldier had been captured and crucified on a hill in France. Oh. And so they think that might have um, contributed to Canadians thinking, like, all these people are just, they don't deserve anything. Um, there was also the fact that they had no attachment to the Europeans. Like, Europeans are like, okay, if we win this war, then the ten years down the line, worst, they're going to be our neighbors. Yeah. Whereas the Canadians, it's like, just their enemies. Mm -hmm. um, another aspect of it was 
Um, oh, what was it? I don't remember. But yeah, Canadians were really brutal. There was there was a few more, but I don't remember what they were. But I th I just think not observing the Christmas truce alone is yeah. is horrible. Um, and then I think Canadians were one of the. F this isn't related to Canadian brutality, but to how scary Canadians were. I think they're one of the few forces that specialized in dealing with uh, like mustard gas and whatnot. Yeah, and uh, charging machine guns. Yeah. <laughs> No, they actually did specialize in uh, taking the pillboxes with machine guns in, like the machine gun nests. There's, I remember we learned about this in history class. Um, there's basically this force that uh, drilled every day of how they're going to attack a point. And then it's like, all right, the weather conditions are perfect. They all got out of the trenches, went across, captured the point. And they're like, okay, what's the next objective? It just like swept through incredibly efficiently, incredibly fast. And... Like, took an objective that, like, soldiers had been, like, sent out of the trenches and got killed, sent out of the trenches got killed because it's just a machine gun. Yeah, so yes. Canada, um, <laughs> you see a lot of uh, jokes about this with their treatment of their native population. Um, but Canada has quite the dark history <laughs> mm. in just in terms of savagery and, and warfare and whatnot. But we're the friendly guys that say sorry and A and... We're funny. Why do you think we're saying sorry? <laughs> we're saying, <laughs> yeah, we've got a, we've got a lot of making up to do. Uh, no, we're making up for. It. We just always passively like throw it in there, and then people are like, oh yeah, they're just saying sorry. Don't know why. It's like, hey, 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 we finally fulfilled their apology quota. So uh, yeah, um, on a very different note. <laughs> yeah, on a very unrelated sort of note. Uh, last episode, we talked about some stuff. Yeah. And I wanted to kind of redo that talk, just in a sense of, like, continuing it. But I thought more about the ideas to make them more streamlined and understandable for myself and hopefully you. Okay. Okay. So, um, firstly, what I was talking about with death and whatnot is that um, there is only one, um, uh, let's say, hypothesis or theory yeah. for death that is deducible from nature which and isn't based upon some sense of fear religion or pleading yeah. that i'm aware of although simulation theory could be a second one based yeah. that would be a new emergent one based on our observation of what's possible with computing yeah. but if ai wasn't where it's at and where it's going and um then the only observable thing we have is that when um molecules relations to each other is actually irrelevant it just happens to create chain reactions that can last for a very long time yeah. and if you look at humans as entropic devices designed to speed up entropy in the universe um, or life in general then you're just seeing a chemical reaction leading towards the death of the universe uh, play out and so when it's over it's over and that's just the chem so that is the only and so what I was trying to say is I only see one that makes sense that isn't just religious pleading or fear Mm. Um, that is observable from the world around. Like, you look and you say, this actually makes sense with what we know. Yeah. But I think that there should be more explanations out there, and I want to learn what they are. So that's uh -huh. what I was trying to say. Okay. And so, um, simulate... And, and you did bring up some that kind of were in that line, but I think simulation theory is the only one that really... But I think the thing about simulation theory is you could say it's infinite, but at some mm. point you would also think it has to end. Um, yeah. This, like, simulations all the way is... I mean, it's not just an impossible idea, but it... Well, it's hard to conceptualize at the very least. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, so I think that's what I was trying to talk about. So I think, like, you did get parts of it, yeah. and I didn't get parts of it, and so there was, right. there was a lot of... So, um, in regards of you, then, the observable things and uh, queries... Oh, you're working at a garden center. Yeah. I was like, why are your fingernails so filthy? <laughs> it was, I was like distracting me. I was like, that's the, you, you come into my recording studio with that sort of, <laughs> you just came back from work at a garden center. Yeah. Okay. Anyways, continue. <laughs> um, it's kind of funny. Yeah. Um, so I guess there, we have simulation theory. We have um, non-existence. Yeah. Something or like oblivion. That. Yeah. Have you and Entropic heat death. Something. Entropic oblivion. <laughs> Have you heard of dream theory or like the dream idea? No. 
So, because one thing we relate death to a lot is going to sleep. Yeah. And something that happens when you're asleep is you dream. Yeah. But, like, like you, when you're in the dreams, you can observe them. Then when you wake up, they start to fade. So, one idea that I have heard is that when you die, it's a never-ending dream. So, like, you go sleep forever, and you dream. Yeah, I find that one doesn't really make sense in the context of what I know. That doesn't mean mm -hmm. it's not true, but dreaming is based upon electric impulses within your brain, and if your brain's gone, those impulses don't have a place to go. Well, what if, right? Mm. Causation, causality, right? So what if dreaming, the side effect of dreaming, is those electric impulses? I mean, yeah, anything, like, hidden with hidden variables and everything, yeah. anything can be possible. Mm -hmm. um, but based on what we're going... The thing is, the idea of oblivion is deducible from current facts. Yeah. And so that leads me to believe, I could be wrong, but it leads me to believe or theorize, hypothesize, that other things should be um, deducible from observable facts. Yeah. Unless there is only one answer. Mm-hmm. Um, there, there's a Rick and Morty episode where um, Rick and Morty are on some alien planet and this alien walks up and it says to Rick, please kill me. And Rick's like, yeah, no problem. Just going to like go to the bathroom and just sit down, like eat some food with us. And then Morty's like, what, what, what's going on? And Rick's like, oh, this guy um, comes from a group of aliens that if you kill, if a great warrior kills them, they basically get like eternal ecstasy and go to a planet. And then Morris like, Rick walks off to the bathroom, and Morris like, oh man, that must be pretty nice. And the alien's like, yes, yes it is. But how do you know? And the alien's like, wait, what? What do you mean how you know? Well, has anyone, like, do you actually know that? And then the alien basically has a crisis of, like, I don't want to actually die. And then it runs out of the restaurant because it's scared because Rick's going to kill it. He gets hit by a car, so it's not killed by Great War. And then these shadowy hands reach out of the ground, grab its soul, and drag it to the underworld. And it's like screaming internal pain. Then Rick's like, oh yeah, no, they actually do know. I don't know why that guy, <laughs> you're like questioning that. Anyways, we have proof of uh, hell now for them as well. And then Rick walks off. Yeah, we, we don't have that um, certainty, which allows a certain amount of uh, freedom and mystery mm -hmm. and everything else. And I think... Well, actually, like, how much would evidence of heaven... Like, straight up, undeniable proof, I guess. Change how people operated. I think you can deny just about anything. Yeah. Um, but yes, let's, let's, I don't know, let's, let's assume somehow it's undeniable. I, I was just like, reduce risk factor, basically, or a small amount. And what would the, um, what would the, would there be any religious um, tones to this? Like... Do you have to live a certain way, or do, you, or is it just there is a heaven that you go to? Yeah, there is a heaven that you go to, and you get what you deserve. Hmm. <laughs> Maybe we don't even need that. But there's just a heaven you go to. I think people would live uh, more carefree lives. Yeah. Like I think, um, uh, I think that is the advantage of an afterlife is that it allows you to have a better life while you're alive. Yeah. Because if you're not afraid of the life you're living, then you can. Um, take risks that benefit you, because risks are often far less than they seem and, and often more beneficial. So is heaven, like, I know we talked about this a bit, like, a de pleading and denial, but is heaven actually a, is the afterlife a technology for humans, basically, to operate better? Well, I think um, that's what uh, Jesus kind of said with the kingdom of heaven is uh, in your mind. Yeah. Uh, whereas the Jews saw the Holy Land as a place and the Kingdom of Heaven as a place. Yeah. So I think it, it would depend on the religion. Um, but I think that Christianity's contribution to the whole thing was that, yeah, this is... it. Th like, Heaven is the infinite stare that we've talked about before. Yeah. And so it is a way to live with your eyes on perfection or something. Yeah. Like a platonic shape or something. Yeah. Like... Well, Moral technologies, I guess. Those are kind of a thing, like, or just advancement in moral idea. I know we talked about this before, like, we've decided that slavery is bad, and we decided that, um, like, we very early on decided that killing each other was bad. 
And now we've decided that uh, killing people from other tribes and other groups is bad. Unless they don't. Unless they do stuff you don't like. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what other tribes do, is stuff you don't like. Otherwise, mm-hmm. they'd be part of your tribe. <laughs> but we have advanced that moral technology, yeah. that decision. And we've decided that um, taking care of animals if is a thing you should do. Now, I don't, I don't know if that's advancing moral technology. Um, or is it? Because... Like, something like um, creating slavery or something might be, or removing slavery. But I wonder about something like not killing people outside your tribe. Because I think you could live an equally good life as a um, xenophobe. uh, xenophobe. Mm. Um, Because if you care about people and you think all people are basically good, but only your people are people... Yeah. Then your world is still fairly. Now, I guess the disadvantage to something like that would be what happened to the Ottomans and what yeah. happened to the Chinese. Yeah, no, I think it's actually beneficial because the more you have to pull on. But then morality isn't actually based around being good, it's based around what makes you strong in an abstract sense. It's like if you grab a club, that makes you stronger in a concrete sense. Yeah. But if you. Um, help someone up, and then they become your friend, then there's two of you to fight whatever comes next. So that helps you in a more abstract sense. So morality is just a way of benefiting yourself by paying it forward. <laughs> and uh, That might have been the evolution of morality. So with, with, And I think also it could be something like... I think a lot of... I think the same about environmentalism, actually. Um, and I actually took a moral environmentalist class, which is kind of funny, um, because I ca- I'm just making this connection now, but it, it's kind of funny because it would fit that class. Um, but when you do something moral or ethical or good, or when you do something environmentally good, I think you shouldn't do it for anyone but yourself, um, which I guess is kind of objectivist. Yeah. Uh, but if you are, um, like if you always tell the truth, yeah. I don't know if that benefits society or not, but I think it definitely benefits you. Well, you don't have to keep track of all your lies. There's that, and there's also the fact that... Um, you become a trustworthy person. When you speak the truth... We're not trustworthy, but an honest person. Well, I don't think that matters, except that when you speak the truth, um, you get answers to... like, Because if you speak the truth, then you say what you want to know and you say what you mean, which means you change the world in the ways that you want and you get the answers from people that you want. So if you're afraid to ask someone something, you could both be living suboptimally because neither of you bring up the topic. Yeah. Like if you, um, let's say you get in a fight with someone and then like 20 years go by and you are waiting for the other person to apologize first and neither of you want to continue not talking to each other but you're afraid to say how you actually feel because you don't want to make it worse or something. Yeah. Um, oftentimes I think you'd be better off just saying it. Yeah. And then you can um, resolve that and move on. Or on a more lighthearted note, um, uh, if you have something like asking someone out, you might think this will make them hate me forever if if they don't want to uh, mm. go out with me or something. But often you just learn new things. Like you, yeah. either, you either learn yes, great, or you learn no, and then you can continue your relationship as it is or differently now knowing that. Yeah. And instead of living in a... Um, Will they, won't they, perpetual yeah. soap opera. Yeah, you leave the Garden of Eden with the truth. Yeah. Like, the the the, tr- the the apple of good and evil is kind of the truth. You stop being a baboon full of snakes. Yeah. Yeah, you got to regurgitate those snakes so that they can regurgitate what they in turn had inside them. Or something like that. Yeah. But it, it, it's a... Uh, um, and that's just the truth. And then there's other things you can... Like, you say you become honest when you do that, and maybe that makes you feel good about yourself. But I think that the real benefit of honesty isn't... Be, I think virtue for the sake of virtue makes you arrogant. Um, well, I was saying you being honest is people know you as someone who's honest, and then that's a good thing to have. Right, but outs, even outs... Yeah, so there's a social benefit. But I think even outside of social engineering and getting people to give you stuff because you're such a good person... Um, I think there is a benefit directly to yourself. Mm. Like, I think your life improves without... Like, if no one else on Earth existed, yeah. you were the only person on Earth, 
I think you'd be better off telling the truth than lying. Yeah. No, lying to your, lying to your, one of the biggest lies and one of the worst lies is to yourself. And they can be very convincing. Like, I know we might have talked about this, but like people can tell themselves lies so powerfully that they actually like dis- mess with their memory. So uh, dis- it's, I think it's called dissociative amnesia. Yeah. Um, and I saw YouTube because I was watching some videos on it because I was kind of curious about it. I didn't learn much, but one thing that stuck out to me yeah. was there was a thumbnail of someone, and the title was, um, "What does dissociative amnesia feel like?" Yeah. And the th- so that was the the title of the video. Yeah. And the thumbnail had written, "I don't remember," mm. and they they were like quoting the person trying to talk about a horrific event. Yeah. But because of the juxtaposition of the two sentences, it was like, so uh, what's dissociative amnesia like? No, I don't remember. Mm. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. Yeah. But it's uh, it's very weird. I, I don't well, really understand it. In, in Jordan Pearson's book, I don't read in the first book, 12 Rules for Life. I don't recall if this was in um, the rule, tell the truth or d- at least don't lie. But he talked about um, one of his clients was basically this woman who her life was kind of like a haze that she's living in. And she basically said to him one day, like, I think I've been raped. And he's like, how, what sort of statement is that, like, I think I have been? And she basically explained that um, she would go to bars and get drunk and then basically get taken home by men and let stuff happen to her. And she'd do that over and over again, sort of, like, blake them out. And finally she, like, came to terms with what she was doing to herself. And well, the sort of thing, like, she basically wasn't really telling herself what she was doing. She's just sort of living through it. Yeah, they're um, in sort of null state, I guess. The videos I was watching, the, watching the person try to talk about their past was really weird because it, it was, um, you know, it, when you have to say something difficult, like it's not necessarily scary, but it can be scary. Yeah. And the, and maybe it's quite upsetting as well. The ability to speak can be quite difficult the inertia to it and it feels almost impossible to get the words out even though all you have to do is say the words yes it seemed to be something like that where they were trying to talk about their past but it almost kept getting shoved down like it'd be like i think it there were yeah. and so they kept um running i guess almost from it mm. um like it was it was like there's a very like if you're if, if there was a very scary image and you were refraining from looking at it and every, and every time you tried, you shied away. Yeah. It was sort of like that. But it's kind of fascinating that you can do that with your own mind. Well, I know uh, it's been written about in quite a few books I've read about like something traumatic happens and like small children's parents get killed. And this, I think, is even a case in real life. Um, and then someone else takes care of them. They grow up and like they're really young, like maybe three or four years old, sometimes even five. Um, five might be a little too old, but basically the trauma of the situation, they go into shock and then they sort of fade that out of their original parents. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, there's people who I was like born and raised with for a bit, but I don't really know who they are. And it's kind of weird too, because um, it, it creates a past of... Uh, um... I think it makes their lives slightly fragmented because yeah. it doesn't quite make sense. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can just gloss over the holes. Like dreams make sense, even though they don't at all. If you, if you wrote them down chronologically. Yeah. And so I think it might be similar to that, but it, it really goes to show how patchwork our memory and our brains actually are. And yeah, they're, they're really based on association. Like that's, that's the classic thing of if you imagine your grandmother or something, they're always wearing the same clothes. That's not necessarily true, but it's that idea of you have an image of them. What she is. <laughs> you have an image of them. The green pantsuits. Yeah. You have an image of them dressed a certain way. And that's because you can associate like grandparent with clothing. Mm-hmm. And so a memory isn't a, a novelization of something. Mm-hmm. It's a association Seri- it's a web of associations that you can draw a story out of well like you can go into a room like it, well you go to your grandparents house and it has that smell like oh that's my grandparents house and then sometimes you'll encounter that smell not in your grandparents house and you're like oh this is just like my grandparents like it has that feeling and um i had a bit weird so- associations today so one of my uh, colleagues 
has a octopus tattooed on her shoulder. And so back in high school in uh, art class, there was someone who looked a little bit like her and also had blue dyed hair. And they made a painting of an octopus. But I was like looking at that, I was like, blue hair, octopus, around my age. Were you in this art class? And it's like they turned out to be like a year younger than you. Hmm. And I was like, oh, that's why I associate because it's like blue hair and octopus. And it's like the person in my class even have tattoos. It's just they had that piece of right. art. And they, yeah, they might have not even looked the same. Yeah. No, I think they actually looked quite different. It's just blue hair is a very uh, easy feature to grab onto. I had a weird thing happen to me recently, actually, with my memory, memory where there's a guy I've known for, um, let's see, it would have been 13 years. Yeah. And I was looking at his profile on Facebook a month or two ago. Yeah. And I was thinking, like, I don't know who this guy is. Like, who, I, I, have, I have no idea who he, who he is. I've known this guy for 13 years, and I don't know who he is. Mm. And I don't know anything about him or... Um, why I know him, I all I know is his name and vaguely what he looks like. And even what he looks like, I'm not too super clear on. Yeah. And I thought, that's really weird. So I was talking to some friends from high school yesterday. Yeah. And I asked them, who is this guy? And they're like, oh, he was on the basketball team. And he um, he was friends with this other friend. And he, he did this stuff with us. And I was like, oh, him. And without remembering details about him i couldn't see him as someone i knew yeah well but once i knew who he was then i remembered him as someone i knew which is it was very weird well what was interesting right is so when we were talking about that um basically i like, came up in our conversation uh, um she asked me what year i was born in so i told her and it's like oh my um youngest brother was um born that year and he also went to the high school that you went to because i talked about the high school and I was like do you know so and so and it's like it sounds familiar and i feel like i know of him but i don't know him and then she said the name of someone else i know it's like that's his best friend like they're always hung up together it's like oh did he go to our elementary school and she said yeah he showed up in the last year it's like oh that's him now i know exactly who you're talking about it's like i had the name i even knew what he looked like but it's just like no complete association and it's like drawing those threads together of, oh he went to my elementary school he hanged out with this guy he showed up in the last year and then high school he was there for a few years before then he went to a different school and like just all that together and it's like that's who you're talking about now and then i can like actually remember things about him knowing and comprehension are two different things yeah and i think that must be how those memory gaps can appear in something like mm -hmm. uh, dissociative amnesia um you they probably know the information, but they probably uh, sever all connections to it or something. Yeah. And so if you see, and I don't know if this is true, but it, maybe if you see something that reminds you of the event, you just become disoriented because you'd be like, I have no associations of this thing because I'm purposely mm -hmm. not connecting it to anything. And I don't know if that's how they feel or not, but I could see that potentially happening, which if that was true, would be quite interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, so the other thing I wanted to, uh, wait, actually, sorry, I got a phone call. Ring, ring. Oh, it's, oh, uh, who? Oh, oh, yeah, the Hitler lover. Yeah, okay, it's for you. What? <laughs> hey, this is Evil Corp again. We just oh, wanted goodbye. to do a follow-up. No, we wanted to do a follow-up from two weeks ago. So, uh, so, uh, we know you don't want to kill Hitler. Um, but, uh, unfortunately, someone listened to the podcast and they, uh, stole your uh they stole our time machine um and so they're going back in time to kill hitler because uh, because they learned about the existence of our time machine it's pretty bad uh, fortunately we have placed a button in your in front of you and if you hit it you can blow up the time machine killing the inhabitant and destroying the time machine and save hitler <laughs> sorry so you're, you're gonna hit that button what do i get for it <laughs> uh we will save a puppy. Oh. I'll have to get back to you on this. Right, well, we'll just shoot a puppy an hour until you get back. How's that sound? And then uh, we'll, we'll let Hitler know if uh, 
if you like them or not, I guess, anymore. Or if your bromance is over. <laughs> <laughs> Look, the changing of history. Yeah. Is a. Uh, is Hitler a person that is needed to be there? Would someone fill in the gap of what he did? Um, is the first question. Do you care if history has changed is the second question. Yeah, that's the second question. I care, but the me that would have the history changed wouldn't be aware. The me might not exist. That might kill the me now, is having history changed. Except or nothing would change. Except you wouldn't die because... I have to be there to stop the person. No, it's it's linear. Okay. So you you time was one way, and then you time traveled, and now time is a different way. But it can t time exists within uh, uh, its own uh, like two dimensional plane of time. See, I think we even talked about this before with the first time. Um, I don't think killing him would do anything. Who, Hitler or the the, the dude? Either. Um, yeah, because Hitler will die if you don't kill him, and he won't if you do. Yeah, no, I, like, I don't think Hitler's actually killable back in time. Well, he is. We got a time machine. Yeah, but I think he might just dodge. No, he doesn't. So you've seen the results of this time show. Yeah, we have a time machine. We, we checked. <laughs> well... I don't really want the events of history in the past to be changed, but I also don't want to kill someone. So what do you care about more? My moral integrity or history changing. Yeah. I think the answer seems pretty straightforward to me, I think. Well? Well, me personally, um, I don't have the button, but I wouldn't press the button because that is knowingly doing a wrong. Whereas if something happens, that's not your fault. That's that's the person in the time machine's fault or Evil Corps' fault for creating the situation in the first place. Yeah. However, the only time when it's appropriate to kill someone is to stop them from killing someone else. However, then it could be argued that you could get killed at that moment because you're about to kill someone. But if you agreed with that, then you would have gone back in time and killed Hitler. Yeah. Which is... We don't know the results of going back in time and killing him because it could be far worse. All we know is that... It could be far better. Yes, but we don't know, and so we have to do it based on our actions. You don't know what happens if you do anything in the present. Yeah, so... So so messing with the past, right? Who cares? Because you're messing with the future constantly in the present. Yeah. I think I'd not press the button, but I'd send a very strongly worded email to the person going back in time. This is actually um, something that there's another way to look at this, which is all your actions right now are more important than worrying about changing the past if you went back in time and time traveled. Because if you change the past and time travel, then you already did it, so who cares? But right now, you have the power to change the future. So everything you do matters incredibly. Mm. Does it really, though? Does anything matter? If you think that things matter, like time travel and whatnot, then you are choosing the future right now. Yeah. And so your decisions are of utmost importance. Yeah. No, I don't think I'd press the button. But also... So I'll stop killing the puppies. An hour hasn't passed, so we're all good. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, it was Hitler's puppy, though, so he's going to be sad now. No, the puppy's going to be sad. Yeah. But anyways, right, thanks for your contribution. But it's interesting comparing stopping someone from killing an evil person but changing the past by ki like you just gave me a good uh, band name. I don't know what kind of music they'd play, but it's, um morality and time travel. <laughs> I think that could be good. Like if you were if you were Hitler's bodyguard, right? Yeah. How many people would you kill to save him? Well, I mean, it's my job. Right, let's say you didn't like him. And thought he should die. Hmm. Hmm. That's a, that was probably poorly phrased. I'm not a very good bodyguard, then, am I? I'm more <laughs> of his assassin than his bodyguard. Except you can't kill him because you're his bodyguard. I'm a collaborator, <laughs> then, or something. Like, I'm the I'm a pretend bodyguard. Okay, if you're Hitler's bodyguard, right? Yeah. You can't kill Hitler because you're a bodyguard. But you can 
mess up in quotation marks when an assassin comes, but the assassin has to get through you first because you have a lifelink with Hitler. So you have to die before Hitler can die. So, well, this is just changing the whole morality of the thing of my self preservation versus my dislike for someone. Yeah. Um, yeah, it is changing it. But it is, it is also, um, like if you were a slave protected by the emperor, but you were the emperor's slave. Yeah. But everyone hated you because you're the emperor's slave. If the emperor dies, then you're in trouble. But if you die, then the emperor can be killed. So it kind of sucks for you either way. Unless I kill the emperor myself. That might be a way out, yeah. Um, but then do you want to do that yourself? Or would you rather have other people do your dirty work? But I, th I think, like... Well, I think if something's to be done, then you should do it yourself. But I think... Unless you can't. That also goes away from the... If all life is sacred, should you protect the life of genocidal people? Well, I mean, I can let nature's case this course. <laughs> Okay, how about this? Actually, I had a dream. I've, I've told you about this dream before. I was um, like Hitler's adopted son or something. Yeah. And he slipped and fell off of a uh, thing he was standing on. Yeah. And all I had to do was stand there and he would have fallen off and died. Yeah. And instead I helped him up in the dream. Um, as opposed to <laughs> recently. Yeah. <laughs> Don't know why I clarified that. Um, and so the question there is, um, yeah. Doing the right thing is still doing the right thing. But, so the question is, do you believe there are circumstances under which you can kill, I guess? And, well, or there, situations under which you well, can let someone die? In our philosophy class, I even clarified um, on the moral imperative of me saying the only time, I even said it's all right, but the only time I can see that it is, it's not even morally good but it's like the only time that you can kill someone is to prevent them from killing someone else or like and who, who stops you well that's the exact thing the first person should just not be doing the killing but and that but then you're you're also a killer who should be stopped like well, by those rules right yes yes i am um and so the other person can try their damnedest to kill me because i'm trying to kill them but there should be a third, like a fourth party that should try to stop you because you're going to kill someone and then someone should try to stop them. Yeah, well, no, that's the problem I only recently realized with it. Um, however, I'm g going to add a caveat to that, which is um, you don't stop the... Um, <laughs> you, you don't try to kill me. And I don't mean that as, oh, you don't try to kill me if I'm trying to kill someone. It's um, so... Like, someone pulls a gun, right? It's going yeah. to kill someone. And I can shoot them and stop them. You don't shoot me because I'm stopping the person killing someone who was never killing in the first place. So I'm stopping... I am protecting an innocent party by going after a guilty party. So you don't stop someone who's... Like, you don't stop two guilty parties. But if there's a guilty and innocent party, then you stop that. So... Yeah, okay. The, Terry Pratchett uh, in Snuff kind of goes into a similar idea where Vimes is having a lot of questions about why can I do all these things that are wrong in the name of good yeah. and why can't anyone else? And the conclusion Vimes comes to is because it's me. Yeah. Which is terrible. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, that might be all that's left. Yeah. Um, but I was saying this moral idea without because it's me. It's yeah. like it's because it, there's an innocent. Yeah, like if I was trying to kill someone who is innocent, um, then someone by all rights should try to stop me. And if they have to stop me by killing me, then that's what they have to do. So what if the innocent misunderstands the situation and they pull a gun to stop you from killing the well, innocent man? Well, then we have man. a Mexican standoff. Not exactly though, because they're pulling a gun on you yeah. to stop you from killing that innocent man that's trying to kill them. And all of a sudden. Well, this this is perspective and yeah, not the tragedy morale. triangle. Yes, yes, it's tragedy. That's just tragedy because it's all morality is also based off each person's personal perspective and you have to go by your own moral code. I'm not sure about that. Like Well, sorry, not perspective observation at the moment. Like it's based on knowledge pretend. Yeah. Well well what um Because like what we said there, they perceive me as trying to kill someone innocent. So morally they are doing like even 
Like, I see someone, right? And they have, like, a draw gun drawn on someone. They're going to kill them. And I'm like, oh, I have to stop them. So I, like, take out the gun to shoot them. Turns out the person they're going to shoot is in, like, a detonator. And then since I kill that person, they blow it up and they, like, set off a nuclear bomb. Yeah. Yeah, and so then... And, like, I couldn't have known, but still. So the way to best commit atrocity is to be innocent or ignorant. Yes. Um, because then you... So it, what Kant said, we, we talked about this ages yeah. ago, but it's, um, you can't know if any action is good or bad. All you can do, the only good action we know of is the attempt to do good. Yeah. So when you go to saving Hitler from falling, yeah. you are attempting to do good. Yeah. But if you let him fall because you could stop his reign of terror, you're also attempting to do good. Mm. Um, but you're doing it at the expense of someone and you, you don't, if you have doubts, like, it's like the more you... You're also doing it at the expense of yourself. Not saving him could have, like, affect you. But saving him could also affect you. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's the whole thing. Like, um, like I said with the whole detonator thing. Like, I thought I was saving an innocent man. Then he kills a bunch of people. That would probably mentally mess me up. But you don't know about that, so you can't take into it. Whereas with Hitler, yeah. you're pretty sure he's going to keep doing what he's doing. Yeah. Um, but you, you still have the issue of... Um, I think we even, we, when we talked about this dream, right, yeah. where you saved Hitler um, from falling, it's you catch him from falling down the stairs, and then you stab him in the back. Well, actually, what I was thinking... <laughs> like, about... you, you do the right thing in saving him, and then you kill him. Well, I, what I was thinking, actually, is, right, you, you letting someone die is wrong, right? Yeah. But killing someone to protect innocence is right, right? Yeah. So what you do is you grab his hand and lift him up, and then you say... Long live the king. Yeah. And you toss him from... So then you take... So that or, might actually be the morally correct chain of events. Or when he's falling down the stairs, you like pull, open up the trap door so he falls down even more stairs. Because then you've made the conscientious action to do something yeah. rather than making the, the... Rather than letting someone die. Yes. Um, now, I believe that you can't actually... Now, I could be... I probably could be persuaded here, but I think that... Um, in action, mm. contrary to, it seems to be the current um, narrative or the current um, zeitgeist. Yeah. I don't actually think that allowing something bad to happen through your inaction is your fault. Yeah. Because the more you know, the more you can change. Yeah. And then again, that leads to um, well, this is what my... ignorance, letting you get a letting. So if I if someone if someone comes up to me and says you are responsible for all the wrongs in the world because you're not doing your part, yeah, then and if I know twice as much as they do, yeah. then I have to do twice as much work as them, mm -hmm. and they are committing all sorts of atrocities that they have no clue about. Well, and it would be no kindness of me to educate them. How dare you not make the basilisk? Yeah, or um, or why do you tell people about Jesus? Yeah, <laughs> um, and, and so I think you can't actually. Um, Blame someone. How dare you not com um, contribute to the communist cause? We're going to have the revolution eventually. You might as well start contributing now. Well, I think even if there's someone um, drowning in a river yeah. and you don't jump in to save them, I don't think you can be blamed for their death. Yeah. Well, my... Um, no, I think if you, if you do jump in and save them, yeah. I think you can be lauded for your heroics. Yeah. But I think that's what they are, is heroics. They're not doing your duty. They're being yeah. a hero. Now, if you're a lifeguard, then it's your duty. Yeah. But, and then your inaction is a thing. But by being a lifeguard, it You've is... You've made that your duty. Yeah, yeah. it's now your thing to do. When, in my philosophy class, our um, final exam, we had to write an essay and bring it in, basically. And my essay was based on the trolley problem. And it was using, applying Kantian philosophy to the trolley problem, which... And it's basically talking about how inaction, um, good or bad thing. Because in the switching the lever, you're choosing to kill someone. Whereas when you leave it, then you're, you're letting what happened would happen. Yeah, which is harsh. I think that nearly everyone gets the trolley problem wrong. Mm -hmm. I think you shouldn't switch the lever. Well, though, that's why I argued not to switch the lever. Because... You don't know the future. Yeah. The peop the five people standing in the way might get off in time. 
Yeah. The one person who's in a place where they should be safe might think, oh, I'm safe here, so I don't yeah. have to move. The other thing to do with that, so so you you have to ascribe free world will to the rest of the universe. Yeah. And you have to you have to let go of the arrogance that you actually control everything. I think. Yes. Um, and the toilet problem is meant to be in a vacuum. And but if it's in a vacuum, I don't think it's phrased right. So I don't think it mm. is actually meant to be in a vacuum. Mm. Because um, beca- I think it's actually meant to be. The question I think they're trying to ask is, would you choose to kill one person to save five? Yeah. I think that's what they want to ask. Like, yeah. would you kill one person to save five? Yes. And... Well, there's like even a rephrase in the trolley problems, a very different way of looking at it, which is, um, you're a doctor's assistant, right? And you have two patients who are dying. And one needs lungs and the other needs, like, a heart. And you open up the door of practitioner. And you smack someone on the head and knock them out when you open up the door. And you save two people by killing one. Yeah, you could drag him in right. and then use his organs to save those two people. Or another one is you push a fat man onto the tracks and yeah. he stops the trolley and saves five people. Yeah. So I think that that fat man is doing nothing wrong. Yeah. And therefore doesn't deserve your... Why don't you jump on the tracks? Yeah. I mean, maybe you're not fat enough, but it's that idea of you can't ask someone to do something that you yourself well, would not yeah, do. You're Even a part of that is um, like with the fat man thing and that um giving the organs you are allowed to do that but you can't make that do that to anyone else you yeah you can make that choice for yourself you yeah. can say i will donate my my heart and my lungs to like, these people with the trolley problem i know there's that uh, that funny video where a kid, guy's like trying to show the trolley problem to his four-year-old and he, like takes the trolley and smacks the people then he backs up and smacks the other person but like let's say you're the only person on the trolley right yeah. there's no one else there and you can basically lock it into the center and hit the in-between and then kill yourself. Mm. That is something that is moral to do. Yeah, but I don't think it's your responsibility. Yeah. I think it would be heroic, but I don't mm-hmm. think it's your responsibility. Yeah. But um, going back to why I think everyone gets the trolley problem wrong, or that I do think everyone gets the trolley problem wrong, mm-hmm. is the problem is that when people think the correct answer is to take the, the hit to their um, morality, or, yeah. or not their morality, but their innocence maybe yeah and kill the person to save the five that's that's what the answer for most people is is yeah. i would change the track to kill yeah. the person i would take this burden yeah and why i think that's wrong is because people have been talking a lot about self-driving cars yeah and what they're saying is this is the same question and we need to figure out the philosophy behind it but i don't think it's a difficult question to answer i think the very simple answer is the car should do its utmost to protect its passenger yeah at the expense of anything else around it Mm -hmm. because what you what you have then is the assumption that everyone else is doing the same thing yeah and that's even the rules of the road is you look out for yourself and people the drivers look out for yourself like i remember we had this joke about um a couple months ago i was about to um make a turn and someone ran a red light and almost hit me and if i'd been hit I'd be, like, going towards the hospital and, like, ICU or whatever. It's like, I had the right of way. Ugh. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It's not my re- That's not what it's about. It's, I should... You should look out for yourself. Yeah, I should make Try sure. I always double check. When you're a pedestrian crossing the street, even when you see the things blinking, you make sure and have eye contact with the people in the cars. Like, stop. So, if you... If these people that think the trolley problem answer is switch and kill the five people design the cars yeah what you have happen is when you try to take this question that's asking to be in a vacuum but isn't actually in a vacuum yeah um because they phrase it because they're not asking a vacuum question and then you apply it to the cars what you then have is cars that will are not safe to be inside for yourself and also the cars will misjudge situations because nobody's judgment is perfect yeah and they will kill their passengers for no reason at all yeah they'll be like oh there is a there's a person crossing the road. I should swerve off into this ditch and, and kill my passenger to save the people crossing the road. Yeah. Even if those people would make it across in time, even if they could jump out of the way. Yeah. So you actually have cars that are worthless as a, a means for keeping you safe. Yeah. And they are senselessly killing people because nobody's judgment is perfect. Mm-hmm. If you have perfect judgment, then the trolley problem um, makes more sense. Yeah. But you don't have perfect judgment. Mm-hmm. And if you want the trolley problem to be in a vacuum of um, These what would you rather save, which yeah. is a way it's looked at, which is wrong, mm-hmm. um, 
but they, they use it because they conflate it, right? So they say, mm -hmm. what if that one person was your mother? What if yeah. that one person was your friend? So, so they start mixing the vacuum with real world examples, Yeah. which I don't think furthers the discussion in a way that, because you're mixing two different ideas together. Yeah. If you want to ask, what do you prefer? Yeah. I think a better question would be, you're falling out of an airplane. Yeah. Um, there is two like bags of people, basically. Yeah. You have one parachute. You can give it to one of the bags of people. One of them contains your mother. One contains five strangers. Yeah. That is a vacuum question because both of these people are going to die until you take action. Yes. There's no longer an option of inaction. Yeah. Um, I mean, unless you're just like, hey, nobody gets it, sucker. Yeah. I mean, you could do that. But if you force the person to take an action, then it becomes a question of what do you prefer? But if the question is, um, will my inaction lead to death or not? Then I don't think it's your responsibility. I, like, if there was no one on one track and five people on one track and it was heading towards the five people on one track, yeah. now that's where you, you test my thing to the extreme. Would it be wrong to do nothing? Mm. And I think look, you didn't cause this situation. Yeah. I don't think it would be your fault if you did nothing. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, I think that if you do something, something worse could happen. Yeah. So you'd have to take that risk. However... I think that the heroic and easily heroic thing in this situation would yeah. still be to change the train. Yeah. However, I don't think you could be blamed for not acting. Yes. Because... And if you do act, I don't think you can be blamed either. In for all you know, you've misunderstood the situation and those yeah. five people are right where they need to be. And if you move yeah. the train, something bad happens. Yeah. Um, and even if you, you're pretty sure it will hit them, you didn't cause the situation. If you weren't in that room... Yeah this situation would still play out. It's not like yeah. you being there caused these people to die. Mm -hmm. You gave them a chance, but it doesn't mean that you um, are responsible for their death because you didn't take it. Yeah. Um, so I think actually the trolley problem would be a lot more interesting if there were zero people on one track and five on another in a way. Um, it wouldn't, it would be an easy question. Like, what would you do? The answer would be obvious. It would be a different question. Well, okay. So five people on the track you're going. Yeah. And the other one's empty. Yeah. However, if you choose the one that's empty, I flip a coin. Yeah. And if it's heads, then the train blows up, killing those five people. No, not k kills everyone on the train. And there's like a hundred people on the train or something. Yeah. Or actually, I think even if you kill those five people. Yeah. Because then you get the case of if I switch it, they could still die. Mm -hmm. But I'm giving them a chance. And yeah. so it still makes sense to switch it. Yeah. But if there's a chance the train blows up. Mm-hmm. I think at that point, you're just doing statistics. Mm -hmm. And then that's actually almost a better trolley problem. Mm -hmm. Because you're like, okay, so that's that's on average 50 deaths versus 5 deaths. Mm -hmm. And I think the trolley problem was designed to try to be utilitarian like that. Yeah. But it's like, how much do you weigh the life of a stranger versus a loved one? Um, but I really don't think that's what the question it ends up asking. I think the question is, do you assign moral responsibility to someone for inaction? Yeah. Um, and I don't think that question gets the answer that people are trying to get out of the mm -hmm. the problem yeah no there's like we had five different versions of the trolley problem that we had to do in class it, it was <coughs> a brutal class actually because i pretty much answered the same thing like my ideas weren't all fully formed but then people like start saying like your mother is on like this thing or like all your friends and family it's like if you switch and it's like really <laughs> you're going to that point but then, okay. then they're asking yeah. what well, they're making it utilitarian mm -hmm. rather than responsibility based yeah and I think if you want to make it utilitarian, you should do yeah. the uh, parachuting one. Yeah. Well, I even um, in my essay, I did say that um, you can make a guess. Like if um, the track's going towards like Jesus, Buddha, Gandhi. Yeah. And switching the... Sorry. Um, switching the track would stand towards Jesus, Buddha, Gandhi. Yeah. And on the track, it's like Mao, Stalin, Hitler, yeah. and like it's just a bunch of other people. It's like, okay, <laughs> like might switch to hit those people, avoid him. Or it's like, yeah, we're going forward. Let's crank this thing. <laughs> like, um, no, like that's almost beyond morality and choosing to be the judge of those people's soul. Yeah. And you're becoming, um, Amit or whatever, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the wearer of people's souls. Yeah. Um, I want to grab something quickly. All right. right. That's basically what being a jury member is, is be yeah, becoming except, the way or someone's soul. Except the thing is, you actually don't. 
Um, because on jury, what you do... It, well, yeah, don't they make sure that you don't do that? Like, it's beyond reasonable doubt sort of thing? Like, So what you do on a jury is you try to make sure that the law um, is carried out. Yeah. Now, the law might be something that puts value on things and weighs someone's soul. Yeah. But you as a juror, they're trying to shield you from that with the law. So what yeah. you're trying to do is make sure that um, you're trying to f- look at the law and yeah. see if you can give the person... Um, so the innocent person, right? Yeah. They don't have to do anything. They are innocent. Like, sorry, the the accused is mm. innocent. Yeah. Innocent um, until proven guilty. Yeah. So they are in, but they are innocent. Yes. Like I think innocent until proven guilty almost um, like it, it's good, but mm. you you have to almost just say they are innocent. Yes. And what you do then is you look to see if it is impossible to say that basically. Yeah. Um. And what you do is, it's not based on how you feel, it's, okay, did they use excessive force? And you say, and so that's why there's the human element of what is excessive force? And that's where the jury comes in. Yeah. And you say, okay, excessive force is um, shooting a man for, like, stepping on your lawn accidentally when he's running by. Yeah. That's excessive force. And that's what the jury's for, is for determining where yeah. those lines are. Yeah. But the law... The law is the judge. No way. The the law has decided that excessive yeah. force is bad or yeah. good in whatever yeah. situation. We, we do not want excessive force. And then the jury's job is, was this excessive force or not? So at some point, a king or a queen or a judge actually did have to weigh people's souls to make those laws. Yeah. And they had to determine a morality for the world. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting because I was talking to a friend yesterday about... Um, he was talking about... Um, the idea of um, infringing upon... You are allowed to infringe upon other people's rights if not doing so would lead to a worse infringement on rights. So, for example, if a um, store requires you... Well, maybe not a store wouldn't be a good case. If a court requires you to wear a mask, yeah. they are forcing you to wear a certain item of clothing, let's say. Yeah. And they are... Um, forcing you to potentially be uncomfortable. So they are infringing upon your freedom because you, you've been limited in what you can do. Yeah. However, the idea behind that is that in something like uh, in COVID or coronavirus uh, yeah. pandemic, um, you are putting people at more danger. So you're more infringing on these people's yeah. rights to safety than your right to freedom is being infringed upon. Yeah. And so you're saying safety at this level is more paramount than liberty at this level. Yeah. And so the only argument you have then is um, coronavirus isn't actually dangerous. That That's the only argument you can make in that case. Yes. However, that would only be if you agree with the idea that safety is more important than liberty or that um, any amount of safety is more important than liberty. Because you can say, I will give up like 0.0001% of liberty. Yeah to gain perfect safety. Yeah. You and you might disagree with that. And so it's interesting that the law actually has a hierarchy of rights. Yeah. And it, so it's like we consider your right to feel this way more less important than your right to feel this way. And we mm-hmm. we consider your right to wear pants less <laughs> sorry, your right to wear not to wear pants less important than people's rights to not see you naked. Yeah, so so it's really interesting that there's um Someone at some point said, I consider this more important than that. Mm -hmm. So uh, where I ran off to, um, because you were talking about your philosophy class and everything, is to grab this book, The Secret Teachings of All Ages by Mm -hmm. Manly P. Hall, which you got me for Christmas, which I just started reading. And there's just a few things in it that, like, The Philosopher and the Fool is just going to become this book, basically, um, for the next, like, I don't know, it's going to take me forever to read because I can't read very well right now. Um, But... I want to talk about the schools. So uh, there's a few things I want. Okay, so first of all, there are six disciplines of philosophy. Yeah. Metaphysics, which is abstract subjects such as cosmology, theology, and the nature of being. Yeah. There is logic, which is the I laws. Thought cosmology was like doing hair stuff. Sorry. No, that... <laughs> I had to get that joke out. I'm sorry for interrupting you, but I had to get that joke out. Uh, there is logic, which deals with the laws governing rational thinking, or the doctrine of fallacies. Yeah. Um, then there is ethics, which is the science of morality, responsibility, and character, 
concerned with the effort to determine the nature of good. Mm -hmm. Then there's psychology, the investigation and classification of forms of phenomenon referable to a mental religion. There's epistemology, which is the science of con concern primarily with the nature of knowledge itself and the question of whether it exists in an absolute form or not. So can knowledge actually be, a, does it exist? Is it absolute? That seems like one of the more narrow ones here. And then there's a aesthetics, which is the science of nature and the reactions caused by beauty, harmony, elegance, and nobility. Mm. And I think that... So these are all philosophy? This is the six um, disciplines of philosophy. Yeah. And I was thinking that actually really sums up our podcast. <laughs> like psychology... I didn't realize psychology would be considered under that, and I think that's well, really Well, psychology does come from philosophy. It's a root word. And I think, I think that's really... Well, one, one is the study of the mind and one is the love of um, uh, knowledge, right? Yeah, but one comes from the root of the other. Oh. No, it's, um, so psychology comes from philosophy. It comes from the school of philosophy. The, the so say inventor of psychology was a philosopher who became concerned with people's right. minds. Right. I mean, like etymol etymologically, I don't think the words are yeah. um, one's based on the other. No, I'm saying like one comes from the other, though. Yes, yeah, psychology is a discipline of philosophy. That's, yeah, that's what I. Yeah. Anyways, um, so another concept they talk about in here, which is really fascinating, is that philosophy is a when you when you partake in philosophy. Yeah. You are looking at the rules which govern reality and what doesn't govern reality, and and to do so. To look at morality and beyond morality, the existence of existence or of knowledge or of truth or of love or anything like that, you are elevated to a level where you are talking about the nature of being, right? Yeah. And the nature of logic and all and all that. So what you are doing actually is partaking in the divine, not in a like oh this is so cool sense, but in a literal sense of you are going through the same process that would be necessary to create the universe. Which means that to do philosophy is to become a demigod, which I think is a really interesting idea. Hmm. Um, so while you are discussing philosophy, you you are a semi-divine being, um, because div divinity is the creation and um, uh, what would you call it? Oneness with everything. So, yeah. and oneness isn't quite right, but and, and to look at that, to gaze upon that, you are. It's like you are. Um, when you try to do like a battle reconstruction, let's say, yeah. you're participating in history. You're participating in the minds of the generals, of the yeah. great generals. Like when you, when people fight battles of Napoleon at Waterloo in, in their war games, yeah. they are becoming Napoleon in a yeah. sense. Like, like that. Uh, so they're like a demi Napoleon. So when you talk about the nature of existence, you're talking, you're, you're becoming a God. And, and I think that's really interesting. So when we're talking about video games, are we a demi fool? Um, well, I think our discussion of video games would probably be, um... The aesthetics one. Aesthetics, yeah, probably. Or, um, I think even, like, it could be a lot of psychology as well. Yeah. Um, and cosmetology. Uh, cosmology, yeah, I don't think so there. But it could be in metaphysics, like the nature mm. of being and everything. Yeah, well... Because we... we talk about intrinsic motivation versus extrinsic yeah. motivation a lot. Um, so we're talking about art, so it is mostly aesthetics, because we yeah. are discussing art, I think. Um, so the other thing, so I had no idea, so I thought, like, Socrates was, like, the first um, philosopher dude, right? Yeah. But in what they call the West, which I think is a bit of a strange way to put it, but in Greek philosophy, let's say, yeah, there was actually, um, uh, how many? There was a group called the Sophos. They were seven... Um, thinkers yeah. who were the first philosophers ever um, and so they were called the wise yeah. and so the first of them his name was Thales um, and he was the first like philosopher ever basically really? um, in Western or Greek like yeah. the Chinese might have had people before him yeah. but Thales is ancient and so what he believed he was the first person to think about the nature of being outside of mythology so and have it recorded um Maybe, but before him, yeah. there was a lot of recorded history, but it was all to do with the gods did this, the gods did that. Mm. So he was going beyond the gods. He was saying, 
this is the nature of things. This isn't a mythology. This isn't a god. This is just how things are. Yeah. And and he was trying to figure out why they were this way. Yeah. Not just they are. He was not trying to figure out. I think before him, people were trying to figure out what things were. And he yeah. was trying to figure out why they were. Yeah. So people like Homer might have come before him. I'm not sure. But he was telling you how it was. Yeah. Whereas Talos was telling you why it was. So what he said was that... Okay, so in um, Fafford and the Grey Mouser, mm -hmm. in the second omnibus, uh, one of the short stories, they have an argument about the world. Yeah. And so um, Fafird, the ignorant barbarian from yeah. the far north, thinks the world is round and everything is stuck around it on a surface and it floats around in nothingness. Mm -hmm. And the mouser, who is a sorcerer's apprentice and wise in a city and raised in the city, yeah. knows that uh, the world is a bubble that floats in water and floats through and all other uh, celestial objects are bubbles in the water. Yeah. And so they have this... Um, Ar logical argument back and forth where he says but if the world was um a bubble then why would this happen and how can water spouts exist and how can uh, why are there clouds and why does why why are there like wouldn't clouds be part of the bubble why don't we yeah. sink through the water and he says well if the world is round why doesn't this happen why don't we fall off why doesn't why don't the stars burn through the water and or yeah. bur or go out because they have no oxygen yeah. so they have this logical debate back and forth and it is actually a debate of logic, which is, I think a lot of books, they would do, like, oh, the barbarian, he, he thinks the right thing. Ha, yeah. isn't that funny? Because he's wrong, but he thinks the right thing. Yeah. But what's interesting is Fritz Lieber doesn't take that easy route out. He actually has mm. them have a logical argument. And Mouser wins the argument because he actually has an explanation for everything. He's like, well, water spouts are when the, the top of the water drips down and touches the bottom. And you see the sunrise because it's, it's lighter in the morning or whatever and rises up and then it sinks in the afternoon. And you can travel between the worlds by swimming through the edge of the world. And so he actually logically wins this argument that the world is a bubble trapped in like an infinite ocean. Huh. And so why this is interesting, I, th I thought that was cool when I read the book. Mm -hmm. But now I'm learning about Thales, who is this first philosopher. And what he said was that everything is based on water. Because water is everywhere. Everything is moist. People are moist. Seeds are moist. So there is water at the core of everything. Yeah. So the first element is water. And since everything's made of water, Earth floats in water in an infinite sea. Yeah. And um, the earthquakes are waves hitting the Earth and causing it to rock. And so this was the first ever um, notion of how things worked. Yeah. And that's what Fritz... Uh, Lieber was talking about so he actually mm -hmm. was referencing the first so it's very cool that like the more you know the more you can appreciate books I thought yeah. was kind of cool um, but Talos is student um, who has an amazing name which is Anaximander I believe um, yeah Anaximander yeah um, who I think is a character in Malazan actually but um, <laughs> he was like no this does your theory doesn't work Amander is a character not an ax. I think there might be an Anaximander, like one of his kids or something. No, it's just called Amander. Okay. Nimander. Yeah, Nimander. Yeah. Anyways. Um, so he said, your theory doesn't work. Um, he went against it because he said fire has no water within it. Yeah. So clearly everything must be made from air. And water is condensed air. And earth is frozen air or something like that. And um, fire... Well, that explains that mod. And fire is like very active air. Which one? Um... It has like different elements, and whenever you do the earth elements, it just creates weird, like puffy cloud bubbles everywhere. Mm. And it's like, well, how is that earth? Um, and he said that the stars were hot metal plates set floating in nothingness. So he thought the entire world wasn't floating in water, it was floating in nothingness. Mm. And that the stars were hot metal plates um, set yeah. around. Um, and uh, so one of these. Um, Later philosophers was a student of Pythagoras, who was not one of the first philosophers. Yeah. Um, but he said something, which was that. So this is his name was Empedocles. Uh, Empedocles. Yeah. Empedocles, and he came up with the theory of transmigration, which was so. This is Pythagoras's student, one yeah. of the first um, thinkers ever. Yeah. So his idea was that after you died, 
your soul went into a kind of loading zone where you could then choose which body you went into next. Hmm. And so you could choose to be another person or you could choose to be like a piece of grass. He believed everything had a soul. Um, for, um, for, I'm going to be a teacup. From like all living things, I think. Yeah. So grass, animals, oh, just people. Oh, kind of romantic. Hmm? It's like a couple dies, right? Yeah. One of them's like, I'm going to be a teapot. Yeah. And that's like, I'm going to be tea cozy. <laughs> yeah. Um, Wrong teapot! <laughs> I'm going to be grass. I'm going to be a cow. <laughs> um, so this was his idea. And so if you um, were, uh, I believe, ignorant or, or um, pain off punishment, you would typically be sent to be like grass or something. But as you got wiser and wiser, you could be... Um, uh, you could be like a human and eventually you could break the cycle by becoming like fully enlightened Yeah, and then you would um, Never be reincarnated again. You'd be reincarnated only once more into pure happiness and you'd stay in that state forever That sounds like um, India. It's... Yeah, it does and it also sounds a lot like like the game is life. I thought mm -hmm. um, And also like simulation theory. Yeah, which I thought was <clears throat> really interesting But like the Indians have the whole thing of you um have to like journey through thousands of reincarnations to finally get to oneness or perfection yeah and so he had that similar idea um he also potentially died in like the most hardcore way imaginable mm -hmm. um this book doesn't talk about it but I, I had to look up a whole bunch of stuff after reading the first 16 pages um which is fascinating like when i read a book right yeah i have a background in like what i'm reading about because like, especially if it's in a topic I know, like if I read a history book, I'm like, oh yeah, Rome. I know about what a Rome is. That's that. Yeah. Like, I don't necessarily have a good background, but I have a grounding somewhere. Yeah. The first 16 page of the, pages of this book have contained more stuff I had no clue about and have never run across in my life anywhere. And it's about philosophy. Huh. Like, I, we do a lot of philosophy stuff. I read a lot of philosophy, like not a huge yeah. amount, but I do read a decent amount of philosophy stuff. Yeah. And this book, in the first 16 pages, gave me, like, 15 things that I've never heard about and had to look up, and I still haven't looked them all up, um, which is amazing. And there's This some... sounds like a book you have to take a pencil to. Yeah, it de like, I was, like, tempted, because, like, he, I'm, like, there's a whole bunch of stuff, like, um, Thales was a part of the Ionians, yeah. um, who were also called Ionic. And I was like, wait, does that have to do with Ionic bonds? Or And it turns out it doesn't. Um, but, I, yeah. like, there was just all these little details. Mm -hmm. There's one of the very first philosophers, like, the third one ever was called Bias. And I'm like, wait, what? Is is that based on his name? And Anima, um, um, Anaxagoras yeah. um, was the guy who, did, like, came up with the atom or something. I guess. So I guess I've heard of him very mm -hmm. briefly. But the, um, one of, like, Anaximander or something also came up with the term... Um, uh, uh, like he came up with the concept of infinity of he said that the universe no it was one of an Anaximander students mm. he said the universe is an infinite mind that um, is so, like an infinite divine mind yeah. that creates without lessening itself so it creates from itself more th finite things but because they're created from the infinite they're also infinite which is very similar to my idea of authors creating um people and us being an imagination of the universe mm. and this was like the you know one of the like the ogs one of the original like 20 philosophers like came up with this idea already mm. it's like you can't think of anything new yeah this guy came up with it um, so how did this guy hardcorely die so he jumped into a volcano and was he proving a point well what they think so there's actually they're not entirely sure how he died. Um, mm. There's two theories. One is he jumped into a volcano when he was in his 60s. Mm. And the other one is he just moved and nobody knew. Uh -oh. um, and he died somewhere else when he was like 109 or something. Um, but the volcano theory, what his critics say is he jumped in the volcano so that there would be no trace of him anywhere in the world. So that people would think he had ascended into like godhood, basically. So it's like, oh, he's, he's gone. He was so enlightened. He's vanished from this world. But how they know he jumped into, no, in quotation marks, yeah. he jumped into this volcano was, um, the theory goes that he jumped into the volcano and the heat was so extreme it sent his sh sandal flying out of the volcano, like the explosion of him hitting the lava sent his sandal hmm. flying out of the volcano. So they found like a sandal by the volcano that was like scorched. Huh. But he, th he jumped into Mount Etna 
and um and like some of the other stuff is like um pythagoras founded the italic school like is that where italics comes from i don't know is it just to do with italy i don't know um but anyway so empedocles said this um a boy i was then did a maid become a plant bird fish and in the vast sea swum and that was his like transmigration reincarnation yeah i've never heard that before i looked it up yeah i can't find it anywhere huh like as far as i know this book is the only place you can <laughs> like well, did this guy do an insane amount of research yeah he went to libraries all around the states and got all these books that were just like falling apart and nobody was reading and had been forgotten by time basically yeah and he put them together and, and um, made a best-selling philosophy book yeah yeah it, it, the crazy thing is and maybe i just couldn't find it because like search algorithms sometimes terrible yeah um but i was kind of like wow there's stuff in books that you can't find on the internet mm. like that might to older people that might seem like well obviously but it's gotten to the point where that isn't true almost all the time yeah but it seems like that might still be true a little bit. Um, but what I find also fascinating, this is so old. Like, not this book, these ideas. ideas yeah. That, well, that, like, Zeno mm -hmm. wrote ancient histories about these guys. Yeah. Right? Zeno was like, um, or, I don't, like, the Zeno with an X, not the Zeno with a Z, I think. Um, mm. But he wrote these histories, like, you know, 500 years ago, these are the first, like, teachings of these people. Yeah. And we've, like... Zeno was thousands of years ago. Like, yeah. Like, it's so old that the only record we have of people like Empedocles mm. is, and Empedocles wasn't one of these first philosophers, is like four scraps of like Zeno talking about this guy that was mm -hmm. 500 years ago type of thing. Yeah. Like, actually, I think we have some of Empedocles' um, books. Like, we have like tiny scraps of some of his books. And he was interesting because he was one of the first and only people to write in rhyme, I believe. Huh. Um, but just, it's... Like, the historians are historical figures. Yeah. Because it's so old. It's a... The, the transmore thing, though. Like, there's that video game where you, like, transform into a bunch of different stuff as you Transmigration. Run. Yeah, transmigration. There's, like, yeah. a video game. And, yeah, and this is called transmigration. Yeah, this idea. so it sounds... And it even falls, like, turning into a fish and then soaring and... Yeah. It's all, like... It's all connected, Connor. <laughs> It's all cool. And the song, Always I Want to Be With You, is... <laughs> no, that was the Unicorn game. Uh, Robot Unicorn? Yeah. Deck. Yeah. No, Transmigration has an original song. Oh, all right. Yeah. A good song, but an original song. I think it's original. Um, oh, yeah. And Empedocles is the guy that invented rhetoric. Like, the art of convincing people. Like, what were people doing before him? <laughs> Hitting each other with clubs and whoever got hit hardest was wrong. Yeah, or maybe they just didn't, um... Well, actually, um... I, I can't remember which book it was, but, um, someone said, we invented arguments so we didn't have to kill each other. <laughs> like, we, we made it so right and wrong didn't have to be determined by killing the other person. And, I mean, maybe before that, there was just people that were charismatic and they didn't know why. Hmm. Or, like, nobody had formally written it down. I'm sure there's been persuaders yeah. since the dawn of time. Yeah. It's just, he was the guy that was like, this is how you do it. Yeah. But then, like, there's other Pythagoreans, like Archytas. Oh, that, Arch! The word Arch? Yeah. Empedocles invented that. I think it was him. Huh. Um, which he meant to be the first. Huh. And he also invented the word which means infinity, which is like, a po something. Hmm. There's a lot of these people I could be getting mixed up, but it's like, these people invented words. Like, hmm. like the first words. Um, this guy, Archytas... He invented the crane and the screw. Like, he invented the screw. <laughs> we know who invented the screw. Like, how is that a thing? Like, surely that was just some, like, thousands of people. But no, it's like, oh, yeah, it's it's, it's Architas. We, we've got this. His name sounds like Architect. Yeah. It's all connected. <laughs> but like, how is there in this, like, introduction, just talking about these little things as a by, like, oh, yeah. Like, I could look up so much on each one of these people that I've never heard about. Except maybe I've heard about Anaxagoras. And Pythagoras. And Pythagoras, of course. But it's like, I f you almost feel like you're, some, I don't know, was my education lacking or something? Like It focused on things else. Yeah. 
But like the the first, the wise, they were Talas, Solon, Kylon, Pittacus, Bias, Cleobolo, Cleobolus, and Periander. Hmm. Have you heard any of those names before? Nope. It's like, these are the first people that had brains. And, and we know nothing. Well, not the first that had brains. But the first people that weren't... Ki- had thoughts about thoughts. Yeah, they weren't just telling stories of the gods. Yeah. So they weren't art... They were like... Like, I think the poets and whatnot, they were basically philosophers, but they, they didn't have the pretentious airs. <laughs> poets? <laughs> pretentious airs? No, because poetry wasn't a talent. It was, yeah. it was a... Um, it was writing the... Word of the gods. The word of the gods. Yes. Yeah. Um... Which I kind of agree with, actually, to a degree. Like, there's so much coincidence in writing that you just kind of... It's just a matter of doing it, almost. Mm. Especially in editing. Um, but and, and what was the other one? <laughs> well, yeah, it was... Um, Pythagoras wouldn't have liked me, I don't think. No. Um, apparently, the first um, discipline he taught <clears throat> was silence. <laughs> <laughs> Before he taught anything else. Why well, does a Greek accent sound like Italian, I guess? No, it doesn't no. sound like Italian. No? No. No, not at all. It's like, uh, kind of, like, like, cracky, like, cracky, sort of. And, like... You, um, I can only, like, <laughs> I can only like think of the Japanese accent. To, but it's kind of like... You the silence! It's, like, stilted. It, it's, mm. it's, it's kind of like a bubbling, mm. cracky, stilted... <laughs> you must learn the silence! No, that's no, that's Japanese. No, that's what I'm saying. That's the <laughs> only one I can think to do for that. Yeah. Uh, but man, it's just like. Well, it sounds like a good book. Yeah, I'm You're not even. Gotten you. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate it. But like, I haven't gone through the intro, and it's like, man, like I found this little poem that. I don't know. Did this dude just make it up and pretend it was in? Imp- because I can't. I couldn't find it anywhere. And. It's an interesting order, like, if there was the idea of ascension. Mm-hmm. A boy, maid, plant, bird, fish. <laughs> fish is at the top. Yes. Lobsters. The very it's top. It's all connected. It's all connected, Con. It's the ho- most holy of animal, the lobster. <laughs> and, and here I was thinking, like, Socrates was kind of, like, the first. The... But, so Socrates was born in 469 B.C., Oh. These people were 546, so only 100 years before, I guess. Yeah. I sort of thought, but, saw um, Socrates as kind of near the end of the philosophers. Like, he had a few students, but then... Socrates had Plato as a student. Yeah, well, Plato had Aristotle. Yeah, it, like, stops at Aristotle. Uh, no, I don't think so. I think Aristotle had students, too. Do you know, Do you know Plato's real name was Aristocles? Aristoc- Aristocles? Yeah. Aristocles. Do you know that um, both Aristotle, sorry, Socrates and Plato probably would have gotten really, really mad at Aristotle? For teaching a non-philosopher? For writing oh. down their teachings. No, Plato was a writer. Was Plato a writer too? Yeah. Because Aristotle wrote a lot of Plato's teachings. No, Plato wrote a lot of Socrates. Yeah, I, I know. And... Plato was a really great writer, actually. Mm. Like he, he, um, He's quite easy to read. I like it. Uh, it's actually surprising. Like when you read the translations, it's probably a really good translation too. When you read the translations though of Plato, he sounds like ver- a normal dude. Well, yeah. Versus the translations of Kant, or even things that have been translated, like they're in English, or translations from several like of the Marcus Aurelius, f- several of the French philosophers. Like those people are impossible to read. No, Marcus Aurelius is understandable. It's funny actually. Like, um, like M- Marcus Aurelius is really straightforward. And I think that's because he's an emperor and a soldier. Sun Tzu. Um, very easy to understand yeah, too. Yeah, Marcus Aurelius, Sun Tzu. Yeah, it's like all... Plato. Like, Plato was also a veteran, wouldn't he? Be? Yeah. Yeah. Whereas it's like these pure thinkers are like, what? Why are you writing? You're pretty sure Plato was. Uh, Socrates definitely was. Yeah. Socrates was like a war hero. Even. Yeah. And it's like, what are you writing? Like, I remember we were um, reading a Fl- French philosopher's thing, and it was um, he was one of the guys who had the original ideas about the perfection of nature. Yeah. Like, he was one of the first environmentalists, as I recall. Mm. And, man, his stuff is to read. And then the woman who critiqued him, oh, she was worse. <laughs> yeah, it's like they've become so pretentious. And So, actually, the start of this book, right? Um, he talks about... Well, I think Kant just had no idea what he's writing about. Like, Kant's writing is just him rambling, trying to figure it out. So, 
the introduction of this book, Manly Hall talks about philosophy, mm-hmm. uh, like modern and contemporary philosophers. And he... Um, so this is what he, I have studied the fragmentary writings of the ancients sufficiently to realize that dogmatic utterances concerning their tenets are worse than foolhardy. Traditionalism is the curse of modern philosophy, particularly that of the European schools. Um, that was one. Of the, there's another part. Basically, he says like all these people that are. Yeah, here we go. Um, I hoped by assuming responsibility only for the mistakes which appear may appear herein, I hope to escape the accusation of plagiarism which has been directed against nearly every writer on the subject of mystical philosophy. Having no particular ism of my own to promulgate, I have not attempted to twist the original writings to substantiate preconceived notions, nor have I distorted doctrines in any effort to reconcile the irreconcilable differences present in the various systems of religio-philosophical thought. Okay, come on. Like, that was clear, but that was big words. I, I can't basically explain what he's saying, right? No, what he's what he's saying is he's unbiased. Yeah, but basically what he's saying is I'm not going to go, fl- uh, Socrates said this, and yeah. by using Socrates, I can then puff up my own philosophy. Uh, here it is. The entire theory of the book is diametrically opposed to the modern method of thinking, for it is concerned with subjects openly ridiculed by the sophists of the 20th century. And true pur- its true purpose is to introduce the mind of the reader to a hypothesis of living wholly beyond the pale of materialistic theology, philosophy, or science. The mass of ab- abstruse material between its covers is not as, um, susceptible to perfect organization, but so far as possible, related topics have been grouped together. So he goes on like these sort of statements. Mm. So He's basically saying these schools like utilitarian, mm. communist, um, uh, like objectivist, yeah. uh, what uh, whatever else you might they're all missing the point the point is to think about things it's yeah. not to blindly jump into a school and follow it yeah and then use other things to prove your school yeah like even like something like stoicism yeah ideally the goal should be the stoics have a method of teaching but they still teach you everything like yeah. that should be the hope but you're instead of becoming a stoic or becoming a and i think that a lot of normal people mm-hmm. actually do do it the way he hopes yeah like most people don't actually like i'm going to be a stoic in everything i do i'm going to be um uh like a kantian in everything i do i'm, I'm going to be an esoteric um or uh, that just means um hard to understand esoteric essentialist <laughs> yeah um yeah which is like yeah, sorry but... deontologist is the people who follow the school of kant mm, right deontologist yeah um and so he says, no, you should just be thinking and looking and reading. And and this book, it sold out of the first two editions before it was printed. <laughs> Did this book lead to a rise in atheism? Or uh, I don't was think... it an answer to atheism? I don't think it would cause atheism. Um because it, it's a book of mysticism. Yeah, but, did, sorry, didn't it become popular basically because people didn't really know? Well, people didn't have... Um, anything yeah um so if we go to the f- diamond jubilee edition yeah um the original edition was planned and issued in the interval between the end of world war one and the great depression of 1929 yeah during this time i had a brief career on wall street the outstanding event of which was witnessing a man depressed over investment losses take his own life my brief contact with high fin- finance resulted in serious doubts concerning business as it was being conducted at that time it was apparent that materialism was in complete control of the economic structure, the final objective of which was for the individual to become part of a system providing an economic security at the expense of the human soul, mind, and body. So basically, this is saying um, you've become part of... You're fixated on making money. Yeah. Because money allows you to do the things you love, but instead, you're making it about money. Yeah. And and everyone has become streamlined into cogs in the machine of making yeah. money. Whereas what you should be doing is trying to um, become a demigod. You should be yeah. trying to be divine in mind, soul, and body. Make money to do the things you love. Don't... Uh, how, 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 Give up the things you love to make money. <laughs> I don't... Well, it's not even that. No, it's um, like make money to do the things you love. Don't make... Like it's sort of like do it to do the things you love instead of make money. Yeah, make money to do the things you love. Don't make money so you can do the things you love. Mm. Um, uh, I, mm. 
Say it again. I I I'm not even half satisfied with that. So um, so there's this. We talked about it not on the podcast, but before. Yeah. Of there's a thing of a process fixation. Yeah. Or um uh, like middleman sort of fixation where you yeah. say money makes me happy, therefore I should make money. Yeah. But then you give up happiness to make money. Yeah. Um because you forgot about the actual mm-hmm. goal. Um and I think that. Well, so the CEO of Blizzard, right? Yeah. He got like a $200 million bonus, um, like from last year or whatever. Yeah. And he makes $40 million a year on top of that. Yeah. Like, he doesn't even seem to like games based on the fact that the company's doing awful. Like, yeah. I mean, like they're doing great. They're making tons of money. But they're nobody is happy with how they're going, right? Like, yeah. Nobody's like, all oh, these people love what they're doing. No, they're just good at making money. Yeah. It's like, okay, so if your goal is making, like, your goal is to drive this company into the ground and make money. Yeah. Fair enough, you know, like, not really, but it's like, okay, you made your $200 million bonus. Why do you still work there? Like, mm-hmm. what, do you need more than $200 million? Like, how does... Property taxes ain't cheap. How, $200 million, and he makes $40 million a year, and, and he's been at it for years, like, and he makes, like, massive bonuses every year. They had some of his... Workers are like minimum wage. They're le- like, yeah, they were like less than minimum wage, and he fired like hundreds this year and like a bunch a couple years ago. And well, he needs to make sure his paycheck stays the same. Well, the thing is, they're making more money than ever, but he, yeah. they're firing people left and right. And I really don't like how Activision Blizzard is like. Uh, it's a, it's awful. But but anyways, it's like it feels like he's given up on anything but making money because. What do you do with 200 million? Like, why do you need more? <laughs> maybe he wants to Scrooge McDuck pool. Like, if you enjoy your job... <laughs> yeah, maybe that's it. But if you enjoy your job, then keep going at it. Like, someone like mm-hmm. um, uh, like Steve Jobs or uh, Bill Gates, I think, even, potentially. Yeah. Um, I think Elon Musk, especially. Yeah. They enjoy their job. Um, and so they keep doing it. They're making tons of money, but they enjoy their job. Yeah. This guy, maybe he enjoys it, but it, it looks... I th- he might enjoy making the money part... But maybe he likes being evil. <laughs> like if you're like, if you enjoy the challenge of seeing how much money you can make every year. Yeah. I guess that's something, but I think you're then missing the point about life sort of like, yeah, maybe it's just like he's gamified it and he's well, forgotten that there's people at the bottom. And uh, the book Magic Kingdom for Sale. Have you read it? Um, I've read the intro, but not the whole thing. All right. But he makes like a million dollars. Yeah. So the main character, um... His wife died, and so did her unborn child. Died in a car crash, and this guy's a high-up lawyer at a firm. And this is um, in like the at a point where a million dollars is a lot more than it was now. Yeah. And he gets like life insurance or something, or how does he get the million? Um, he's a lawyer. Right. So he's just um, saved money, and he's high up in a firm, and he's been working for something like twenty years, basically like solacely ever since his like wife died. Right. And he gets home one day. And there's a magazine. And it's a magazine that's basically, um, like, only rich people ever use this magazine. It has ridiculous stuff. And he, like, picks up and he remembers how he and his wife used to go over these things and laugh about all the ridiculous stuff. So he flips through the book and he finds Magic Kingdom for sale, one million dollars. And so he's basically like, why the heck not? Yeah. And so he... Trade your money for adventure. Yeah, he trades his million dollars to buy Magic Kingdom. And then... He, like, throughout the series, he fixes up the kingdom. But at one point, um, he's basically in the mists of Avalon, his, like, equivalent. Like, they're not actually that, but he's, like, in these mists that make you see things. Yeah. And so one of the visions he sees is, like, his wife, and it's, like, really injured, and, like, a five-year-old little girl who's really injured, and they're saying, like, you abandoned us. You went to this fantasy world, and, like, you've left behind our memory. Mm-hmm. And, like, he gets over that challenge and i think a challenge before that is he um sees his best friend and his like best friend's older and really overweight and he's like they've taken everything from us the firm is gone like ever since you left and took all your money like um these young people took and like took all you have nothing left and even though like he spent a million dollars he still had like a house and like the firm was still his but like all that money's gone now so like everything he's ever made is gone and he's like yeah, well, that's not a part of my life anymore. I've got this magic thing to have to take care of and this new person to save. But he, like, basically just 
the he realizes basically when he like buys the magic kingdom like it's slightly on whim and it's like oh my wife probably will have approved best so basically like when he's sitting there and he's like miserable and he's just been doing this thing over and over he's like what have i been doing like let's do something else yeah like i i need to stop this this isn't life maybe that's what the ceo of blizzard's doing like magic kingdoms aren't cheap anymore no <laughs> cost more than a million dollars yeah but i think the point of that story well not the point because if you write a story with the mm -hmm. theme in mind you're writing propaganda but yeah. um i think the message that you can take from it is um you know the money isn't actually worth anything yeah like obviously it's worth a magic kingdom which is great well his magic kingdom sucks like he gets there and he has like four subjects and a crumbling castle but that, that doesn't matter yeah. it's the if he hadn't been focused on making money in the first place he wouldn't have needed the magic kingdom yeah but the the cost of the magic kingdom was everything he had it should be everything you have yeah yeah it, it's a million dollars ten dollars it doesn't matter as long yeah. as it's everything you have yeah yeah and um and then it doesn't matter what it is as long as you are no longer fixated on making money because you no longer have money is no longer a thing you do instead yeah. it's about the adventure or the raise or the fixing of the kingdom or something worthwhile yeah and so i think that's this guy was um he was seeing the boom of the 20s and he was seeing uh these um and he, he <laughs> didn't he see like basically the rumblings of the great depression um horizon well he, he yeah, like he saw that guy kill himself and everything, yeah. um, which I think was probably at the start of it. Yeah. Um, but he, he, uh, people were looking for meaning, and all they had was the uh, what the schools, like, like the the philosophical schools, were saying. This is this is mm -hmm. this, and this is this. And I, I think a lot of people that um, talk in that way also tend to have a bit of a chip on their shoulder. Like I'm not saying he's jealous or bitter or anything. It's more. Uh, like uh, what's his name Gary Coleman or whatever that he he doesn't like um, mainstream science because they reject Bigfoot and stuff um, whatever that channel's called Bob Gimlin Bob Gimlin Gary Coleman Gary Coleman's an actor is he yes oh okay I was like what <laughs> yeah Bob Gimlin anyways yeah he's like an actor I think is he like a writer I don't know anyways <laughs> um <laughs> Uh, Bob Gimlin, he has that sort of like, oh, academia is yeah. so snooty and superior. So I think there's probably a bit of that here. Mm -hmm. But also the fact that like, I saw a bunch of stuff I've never seen before just like that is pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the other thing is this book was written. So now a lot of that stuff is probably a lot more mainstream because yeah. this was a very popular book at the time. Although a book being popular back then was different from now. I think he yeah. sold like 700 copies of the first two prints. Yeah. Like, that's not much these days. Mm -hmm. But... It's... Just remembering Apart from Magic Kingdom for sale, hmm. which I don't know if it really applies to what we're talking about. But um, at one point, the main character is trying to get allies together, basically to fight the evil army, and to... Um, convince one of the other kingdoms basically like these group of barbarians to actually properly serve him because they are under his kingdom he challenges their chief to a contest or more he gets challenged by the chief to a contest like if you think you can rule us then i challenge you to a contest and so he's like all right i challenge you to a boxing match and because he like did boxing in college and um so he basically they lay out the like the rules of boxing and um that they have like the fighting ring as like last one standing and when they're getting ready like the chief is just there like has his bare knuckles out and he gets his servants to make him a pair of boxing gloves he like puts on proper boxing gloves and the barbarians and like chief are laughing i was like these things are padded they're like not going to be able to hit hard you're just, like why are you wearing these things and he ends up absolutely destroying the chief because like to protect your hands yeah he, he even goes on about how in the books like old bare knuckle boxing matches would go on for hours and became a thing of endurance and like the, one of the longest matches or was like around eight hours and like both exhausted because they didn't want to like throw punches at each other anymore they don't want to break their hands yeah yeah boxing gloves are to allow you to hit harder yeah yeah so he actually like absolutely like he gets hit a few times so it's like the chief's like way bigger than him way more fit he's like a man in i think his 40s or something this chief's like a 20 year old yeah but he wins because he has a deceiving technology <laughs> I wonder how accurate that would be. I think bigger people would typically... Well, they're around the same size, just like the guy was fit. Right. All right. Uh, 
I think he was actually even more skilled at straight up boxing, like the technique of learning boxing versus being a brawler. There's a little difference. That's quite the picture. Yeah, I think it's a. Um, it's probably it's the cover of the uh, the secret teachings of all ages. I'm pretty sure it's a, like an alchemical something. Yeah. <laughs> Overarching recipe. Um, an encyclopedic outline of Masonic, Hermetic, Kabbalah. Kabbalistic and Rosicrucian symbolic philosophy. Mm. But it's uh, very fascinating, anyways. I mean, the book had to be good to last around, to be reprinted so many times. Mm. That is, as... Yeah, this is the. Uh, well, this I don't think is a new book. Yeah, this was print. I think this was printed in 2003? Even then, like, the first book was, like, over 50 years ago from when well, that was. Well, this printed. is the 60th anniversary yeah. book, and this was printed in 2003. Yeah. Yeah. So it had to be a good book. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's... You don't reprint the book. (laughs) Yeah, no, it's been going for a while. But yeah, it's really fascinating. And just the more I learn, the more I I find respect in books and stuff. It's cool. Although if I was to, like, have a different copy of that book, right? Mm -hmm. I'd, like, want a giant, basically, tome to lay on a coffee table with, like, all the pictures. Like, not the um, reduced amount of pictures this one has. Like, that's the research edition, but, like, the... Sort of like original NASA thing. Have it Probably on, costs a fortune. Yeah. Have it on like a coffee table basically as like a centerpiece. It's like, oh, you can, if you're just sitting in this house, like, oh, take a look, peek at this. It's printed in 1928. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's fairly... Near to 100 years old. Yeah. Getting on that way. And, uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. I think probably... Are we in there? Yeah. Add a few things there. <laughs> I'm just uh, 